Okay, welcome to the May 1st meeting of the Satellite Rotary Club of Military Family Support. Uh, we're pleased to have with us this evening a really cool guest. Um, and the first thing we do is we go around the room and introduce the Ro Rotarians who are present, and then we're going to rat out the ones who come in late. So first, let's talk with, uh, I see you're muted, Josh, but this is, I think, your first official Rotary meeting you've joined. So welcome. Hi, happy to be here. It is my first one. I, uh, I appreciate you sending the invite at uh, the 11th hour. <laughs> yeah, we we would take we've taken to doing that as a reminder to people. You know, we have two rotary meetings a day, the noon club and then the evening. So uh, we're glad you make one of them and uh looking forward to working with you throughout the coming year. Yeah, absolutely. Um glad to be a member. Um happy to be here. And um do you it, is this gonna run till 7 30? I just want to let you know I, I have a hard stop around seven. No, we we run exactly one hour, Josh because we're recording it and then the meeting is replayed on the KWST next week. So we go one hour or less so that we can, we can fill that one hour time slot. So we're, we're pretty good about that. Um, okay. so I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. Don't worry about it. So, and so to tell everybody who you, who you're representing. I work for waste management. So um, in San Dimas, we're the franchise um, solid waste hauler. And, and um, it's really, I, I consider myself very fortunate that part of my job includes partnering with um, organizations like the Rotary Club and all of the cities that um, that we service. So when we talk about Action 60, which is the part we talk about the community stuff we got going on, one of the things coming up is the uh, feature of the year, and we'll be seeing you next Thursday. So, but let's move into uh, next introduction, Isabella. Hi. Isabella Foster, second year secretary, second year and second generation Rotarian of the Satellite Rotary Club of Military Family Support. Very cool. My name is Raymond Foster. I happen to be the first generation. So um, uh, I'm also the immediate past president of the Noon Rotary Club and uh, Isabella is one of the founding members. So let's begin. Let's talk. Let's let's get our guest in here because I'm excited to hear her story. Uh, Amanda Huffman's journey has taken her from serving in the Air Force to embracing the role of a devoted stay-at-home mom and Air Force spouse. Her story began when she and her husband crossed paths at California State University Fresno the Bulldogs, setting the stage for a remarkable journey that would span different corners of the United States, including New Mexico, Ohio, and their current home in California. Their journey as a couple blossomed into parenthood in 2013 when their son came into their lives, and in 2015, they expanded their family further, becoming a loving family of four. During her time in the Air Force, Amanda embarked on a significant mission in Afghanistan as part of a provincial reconstruction team. Her background in civil engineering played a pivotal role in various off-base missions where she actively contributed to the nation-building efforts in Afghanistan. To keep the folks back home informed and share her unique experiences, she began writing heartfelt letters that resonated with her readers. Revisiting these stories through her blog not only helps Amanda reconnect with her past, but also serves as a platform to shed light on the vital work being carried out overseas. Amanda firmly believes in the remarkable contributions of women who have played pivotal roles on the front lines, engaging directly with the people and making a lasting impact. Welcome to the Military Family Support. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, you're muted. Uh, take it away. It's your show. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and there we go. Um, how do I hit play? There we go. There's my slides. Um, I'm really excited. I'm going to talk a lot about my book, which is A Girl's Guide to Military Service, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about my story. And so, um, who am I? We got, that was a really, really nice introduction. I think it was better than my introduction, but I am an Air Force veteran. I served from 20, 2007 to 2013. I am now a Space Force spouse. I was an Air Force spouse, but my husband transferred to the Space Force about three years ago, I think. It all runs together. Um, but I'm a mom of two boys. They're now eight and ten. And then I've written two books, Women of the Military and A Girl's Guide to Military Service. And then I'm also a podcaster. I have a podcast also called Women of the Military, where I share the stories of women who've served in the military. And there's over 270 episodes 
on the podcast and in the last year I've started doing videos so I have a YouTube channel as well with some of the episodes not all 270 um, and then I'm also a freelance writer and blogger I write for Military Families Magazine, uh, Spouse Link, and Clearance Jobs those are the main publications that I write for and that's oh and that's me and my family at Disneyland I I love Disney and so that was a, a fun trip um, and there's my boys and my husband. And then here's a little bit of an overview of my military service. I graduated from Fresno State. I like that go Bulldogs. And uh, I got my degree in civil engineering. So I went into the Air Force as a civil engineer. I married my husband in 2007 as well. And then he was already an officer in the Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base. And I was able to go there as well. And it was a pretty cool assignment because the F-117 was being retired right when I got there. They did like the final ceremony and then they started preparing for the F-22 to come. And so as a civil engineer, it was really cool to see all the different projects and really get a hands-on experience of learning about being what it was like to be a civil engineer from the operations side and from the contracting side, all of it coming together. And while I was at Holloman, I found out that I was deploying with the Army on a provincial reconstruction team. And so I left in November of 2009 to go to Indiana for four months of combat skills training. And there we did a few months on our own with the senior leaders learning about uh, Afghanistan's history and culture and contracting and just getting the basics that we needed for the technical aspect. And then after uh, Christmas, we came back and we spent two months doing the combat side and the infantry units were there as well. And so we were doing like lots of uh, going all <laughs> off the base practice and learning a lot of things. And it was January in Indiana and I'm I'm from California and that was my first winter experience. There was a lot of snow, a lot of cold. I was like I didn't know that you could be outside when it was below freezing and not be freezing. It was it was quite the experience. And then in February, late February, early March, we landed in Afghanistan and we started at Bagram. Then we went to Kapisa, which was about an hour convoy from Bagram, north of Kabul. I think it was east. I'm going to just go with east. <laughs> it's either east or west of Bagram. And uh, I was there with another civil engineer. And then our job was to manage all the projects. And so we had schools, bridges, roads, lots of roads, a few government buildings, and a few smaller projects like retaining walls and other things that the villagers asked for. And so we would go out on missions at least once a week and we would go and inspect the projects and uh, get to interact with the Afghan people. And so it was quite the experience. I got, I got selected for captain at the end of the deployment. I got a combat action medal from the Air Force long after I got home. It took a while to get approved. And then I also received a Bronze Star from the Army. And then while I was deployed, my husband got accepted to get his master's in Ohio. So I came back to a box of stuff he left behind. And then I moved yeah, to Ohio and joined him at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And I worked on uh, energy management, we'll call it. And that's what I got to do. And while I was there at Wright Pat, I got promoted to captain. And then I, my husband finished school. We were both uh, captains at Wright Pat. He was doing, I don't know, something at AFRL. And I was working at the headquarters. And then in 2013, when I found out that I was going to have a son, we decided that I would separate from the military. And so I left the military to be a stay-at-home mom. And then I I quickly learned I needed something for me, and that was how my blog started. So it was kind of a business adventure, but it really was more of a hobby in the beginning. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I wanted to talk about. 
But one of the things that I saw was that when I talked about my military experience, people were interested in that. And so I tried to talk about what it's like to be a mom or what it was like to travel or all these other things. But the only thing that really resonated with people was my military experience. So I started to dive deeper in that. And I got the opportunity to go to the Military Influencer Conference in 2017, where I met some of the editors for some of the military magazines. And I got published in the Military Spouse magazine and also met the publisher or the editor for the Military Families magazine. And so that was how I started doing freelancing. And I also realized that there wasn't a good focus on women in the military. I originally was going to focus on deployments. In 2017, I did a series where you write every day for 30, every day in October, so for 31 days. And my focus was deployments. But as I sent out the call for like stories and asked people and got interviews, it ended up getting 99% of the stories were from women. And I heard these amazing stories of what women were doing in the military. And so I said, who cares about deployment? Let's focus on women. And that was where I shifted my focus. And I spent all of 2018 collecting stories, which is what became my book, Women of the Military, that I was planning on publishing on my blog. But as I'm a military spouse, we moved across the country and and I was a little overwhelmed. So I decided to put those stories in a book, and then I also decided at the same time I should start a podcast, and so Women of the Military podcast started in January of 2019, and it's always been focused on sharing the stories of women. We start with, why did you decide to join the military, go through their career, if they transition, talk about that, and end with advice for the next generation, and the advice question was kind of an accidental question, but maybe something I was interested in. And through hearing the advice from people, young women started listening to the podcast and they started asking me questions. And so I created a short little guide about joining the military and for girls. And that idea led to my book that was released in 2022, um, A Girl's Guide to Military Service. And I also had the opportunity to host a podcast for Savio called Breaking Into Tech from 2022 to 2024. So that's a little bit about the work that I've done. And then uh, why write a girl's guide? Women are the fastest growing group of veterans. They are growing at just the fast rate and there's not a lot of resources for women who are joining the military. Even though there's so many more women who are joining, there's not very many good resources. And there's a lot of work being done by the VA to help support this growing group of women veterans, but there's not a lot of resources for helping girls to get into the military. And so I had done some research and I had read some books about joining the military and they always seem to have a chapter written from a male's perspective of what it was like to be a woman in the military. And so I said, I want to write a book like that, joining the military, but spoke focused specifically on a woman's perspective and share the stories that I've learned from my podcast and from my own experience. So I decided to change the focus and write this book. And it's, it was really a lot of work. Um, I learned so much about the military. I thought I knew a lot because I've been interviewing women for about I guess over two years before I started writing the book. And so I had interviewed every branch and I still haven't interviewed the space force, but that doesn't, that was, they weren't a thing yet. So I had interviewed every branch. So I thought I knew a lot, but there was still so much more to learn. And so I also worked really hard to think about what questions I had when I was joining the military. And I got great feedback from other people on things that they wanted to know about and, focus on different aspects. A good example of this is in the basic training chapter. I was an athlete, so I I was a runner and I the fitness part for basic training was easy for me. So when I wrote the basic training chapter, I wrote all about the mental toughness because that was the part that was hard for me. And my friend read it and she said, 
what what about the physical fitness side? And I was like, oh yeah, there's two sides. And so I added a whole nother chapter just about physical fitness and preparing for basic training on that side. And then my husband was talking to someone and he mentioned how it's so important for young women to have like strong financial background and especially with the changes of retirement of not having the 20 year pension but having it where you can invest and how critical that is for women since women leave the military at a higher rate than men. And so I added a whole chapter about finances and why that was so important. And so I really learned as, you know, a writer, how to be a better writer. And then I also learned so much more about the military and the branches that I didn't serve in and even a little bit more about the Air Force as well. And then the topics I covered, I started with the basics of deciding is the military right for you? So it's to join or not to join. We go through the benefits and the good things about joining the military and then discovering your why. And then finding your fit is all about figuring out what branch is right for you, what career field is right for you. Should you serve on active duty? Should you do the National Guard? Should you do the reserve? What option fits your lifestyle? And just the purpose is to have like all the options in front of you. It also talks about enlisting and being an officer and what the differences are and the different paths that you can do that. And then we go into basic training. We talk about the physical aspect. We talk about the mental aspect and just some basic tips that you need to know when you're going into basic training. And then we go into emotional success, which is talking about mental health and just, um, helping you prepare for what you need to know as you transition from that basic training point to being in the military. And then personal success, helping you with mentorship, financial um, readiness, motherhood, and relationships. Those are the main things we talk about there. And then career success, we talk about you know that transition from being a basic training uh, member to being an actual service member, what that looks like and how to start planning for your future because one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I felt like so many people leave the military and they don't know what's next so I think when you're joining the military you should already be thinking about what am I going to do when I get out of the military and you can always change your plan but if you have a plan it really helps you to be set up for success so those are the topics that I cover in the book and I got some really great feedback for writing the book. I got some uh, quotes from different people that are on the first two pages from different veterans who served in the military. And I actually recently talked to someone who told me, she said, your book is really good for people enlisting. She's like, I don't know about officers, but enlisting for sure, which I, I took as a real compliment because I served as an officer. And so it was really important to try and give balanced feedback and not have it shown as like, you should join the military as an officer. It's the best way to go because I don't think that's true. I think you have to figure out what's right for you. So the fact that she shared that with me really was positive feedback. I've also gotten emails from young women who are considering joining the military or in the process of joining and talk to me about how much the book has helped them figure out what they needed to do. And so that's been really great too. I got submitted for a few awards and you can see on the cover of the book, I got the gold medal for the Benjamin Franklin Award, the silver medal for the Military Writer Society of America, and then the Book Excellence Award. And so it's been great to get such positive feedback from different organizations with uh, submitting my book and having it honored in that way. And then I'm still working to get the book out into different places. So I'm working to get the book into recruiting stations. I would love to have it in a recruiting station so that recruiters can hand it to girls coming in who are looking to learn more about the military and they can say, here, read this book. It'll help you get started on the right path. And I've also started working with JROTC programs and ROTC programs on colleges to try and get the book into the hands of more women. And then doing things like this, media uh, events and talking to other people about my book and just working to get it out there into the world has been some of the things that I've done. So 
that's all I had. I know I'm like a fast talker, but <laughs> I wanted to know if you guys had any questions or what else you guys wanted to know from me. Let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, see. Dominic is come, and um, hey Dom, I wonder if you wanted to uh, take over, or are you there? I I'm still here. Can you not see me? Yeah. No, I'm still here. Sorry, I would have been here sooner, but someone decided as we were starting to throw a beer on the ground, so that went really well. Um, yeah. Uh, questions. Let's see. I'm trying to think what's a <laughs> trying to think what Raymond won't ask is what I'm trying to start with. So, you know what, Raymond, just start, and I'm going to find the question I'm going to ask after you're done. So I, I had a couple. Um, Dominic and I are both veterans, um, but from very wildly different eras. I enlisted in 1975, so uh, it was a little bit different. Um, and I enlisted in the Coast Guard, whereas Dominic is a Marine. So that's, again, very vastly different experiences. I wondered what was the most common question that girls had. About joining? Yeah, about joining. What's the most common question that they, they, they or, or a common question that women had about going into the military? I think the most common thing is that people feel like, is this really right for me? Like, is this the right choice for me? And I've heard from women, like, I didn't feel like I could join. And then I heard stories of other women, and then I knew that I could do it. So it's kind of like they needed the self-confidence from other women's stories and, like, resources that are telling them, like, you can join the military um, if you have the desire to do it. So I think it's just that self-confidence push that they needed to to actually make the leap. Very cool. And the next one was... In, from your perspective, what is the most the most interesting, and I use the word interesting purposefully, difference between the male and female experience in the military? Uh, I feel like, I guess it's like, that's kind of a hard question. I feel like you're kind of under a microscope when you're a woman in the military because you're so unique. And like, I mean, my team, when I was deployed, they would call me the precious cargo because, you know, I was one of very few women. And so... They, but it was like a lovingly brother sister type of thing. It wasn't anything. Some people were like, that's so offensive. I'm like, no, that's just how it is. And so I think just like standing out in such a unique way and trying to figure out how to navigate that because sometimes being one of very few women, you can get attention that you don't want. And, you know, that can be, I think that can be really hard. I was going to say one of the survival strategies for a boot camp and military life is get into the middle of the pack, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. GP in the middle, that. right? But I mean, if you're the only women, one of one of very few women on a deployment, again, you're going to stand out, and you're going to you you're looking at both unwanted, well, unwanted and too much attention. Right. Yeah, right. for sure. Now, my second, my, this is a funny question. I taught a single semester at Fresno State. And I had a bunch of Air Force, I guess, ROTC uh, cats in it. Probably. Uh, in 2007, you and your husband weren't going to school back then, were you? Uh, I graduated in 07. So, yeah. Oh, these my husband my... had already passed, had graduated. He graduated in 06. I'm good. I didn't, you weren't in my, you weren't in that classroom. That's very funny. Um, hey, Dominic, what about you? Questions? <laughs> of course, Raymond was teaching a class somewhere where he possibly would know you and there'd be a crossover in some way. Not even remotely shocking. Uh, <laughs> um, Air Force. I think that's a. Um, I think that you both, your husband, you were an Air Force couple. Uh, but before that, you both chose the Air Force. What What was the reasoning between all the branches? You're looking at. And you said I had to be in the Air Force. Um, that I, I don't know if that had anything to do necessarily with being a woman or of that nature. But what, what What was the big reason? What was the draw for the Air Force? Um, well, I looked in the Navy and I was like, yeah, I don't really like being out on water. And then I felt really intimidated by the Army. And I don't even think I was like, the Marines, not even possible. And so I I went to my dad. Actually, I told my dad I wanted to join the military. And he was like, OK, let's go. And he took me to the Air National Guard Station in Fresno. And uh, I met some of the people there because he knew a chief who was there and so he took me to the recruiter and so I started looking into it and that's when you know the Air Force people were like Air Force is the best 
you yeah. want to join the Air Force. And then my friend at the same time, he heard that I was looking at enlisting and he was doing ROTC at Fresno State. And he said, you should you should look into ROTC before you enlist. And I was like, OK. He's like, you'll have to salute me. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, but OK. And so <laughs> he uh, encouraged me to come to the open house. And so I did that. And it seemed like a really great option. And so, uh, yeah, Air Force ROTC seemed perfect. But, yeah, I did not want to deploy with the Army, but I did. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. No, I, just, you know, I didn't know that. Added, what, what particulars were that? And that's that's that sounds perfect. Um, and now, I guess my next question would be is, how is it being, you're an officer still. You're always an officer still. How is it to be now in the Space Force, but now you are, you're still an Air Force officer, but now you're, you're. I deal with my uh, my sister in law and everything of that nature. She, my my brother in law is an army major, and hearing her experiences and stuff like that, I imagine yours are a million times different because you're not just a spouse, man or woman. Uh, so, what's it like now to be on a space force base, or a fort, or how I guess I don't even know what you'd call it, a base? Yeah, they're bases, I think. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> how, how is that now for you? Like, how's that? How has that changed? I mean, I'm sure that's probably in your book about talking about like that time where you've come, you've transitioned from, you know, wearing the uniform to now just wearing regular civilian clothes. Yeah. I mean, it was really hard to transition out of the military and it was really hard to, I thought that I knew what it was like to be a military spouse because like I did the spouse things. I went to the spouse club. I was really involved as a spouse, even though I was still active duty. And so I was like, it'll be easy. It'll be great. And then I lost, you know, my purpose and my identity as being someone in the military and became a spouse. And then I would speak, you know, military speak and the military members would look at me like, what, why, why can you talk like us? And then I'd be <laughs> like, oh, I'm a veteran. They're like, oh, I get it. And so it was really hard. I, someone just emailed me about an episode I wrote. I did a long time ago um, when I was first starting about like my grief of leaving the military, the loss that I felt and how I went through the five stages of grief. And I think mm. I was processing like all these emotions and figuring out who I was as a spouse. And I'm initially, the reason that I said like, I don't even want to talk about, I want to talk about being a mom. I want to talk about travel. I want to talk about this was wow. because I didn't want to talk about being in the military. So like part of my process of was like, I didn't, connect with veterans or do anything for a long time until I started the podcast and I was like full in military spouse and kind of like pushed my veteran side but then the military spouses were like you're different you need to talk about veteran stuff don't talk about military spouse stuff so it was quite the journey and a really a really hard challenge fair, fair enough Raymond do you have anything else do you write anything else down well yeah we no talking? I I did. As a military spouse, I, it, it's going to mean you may not have this perspective. Uh, this club was formed for a specific purpose. And so what we have done in the last two and a half years is uh, gathered 23 tons of food and supplies for food pantries that serve as junior enlisted families at 29 Palms and now Camp Pendleton. We'll be expanding to Fort Irwin in September and then hopefully to Nellis in March of next year. And so that experience on the, the 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 needs of the military of the military families and so i'd like to like what's the top three things that a military family needs that a support group might be able to help with um i know there's a lot of talk about unemployment so i know there's a lot of things happening on capitol hill that are important but i also feel like i like i don't care about i'm i'm not I have my own business so I'm technically employed and I'm really happy and so I feel like figuring out what people want that's not like the big things that like I guess feel like so many military spouses probably because of the groups I'm in are talking about unemployment but then I feel like things like child care I think like if there's a way you can help with child care especially with young enlisted families that like even like a night out so that they can reconnect with their spouse or or giving a mom a break or a dad but i think those like child care is a big a big issue for so many military families i don't know if that's something that you guys are is out of your purview but yeah 
I feel like it's hard because when you move, you have to like start over and you don't have that support network. And sometimes I feel like people <laughs> expect me to do stuff and I'm like, I, I just moved here. I don't have like, now I'm close to Fresno. So I actually call my mom and I'm like, hey, can you come down here? But a lot of my friends or military spouses, they don't have that support. So they rely on each other a lot once they get connected. But if there's ways that you can like connect spouses so that they can meet each other, so that they can have the support network or or finding ways to provide those resources. Cause I think it's really can be really lonely to be a military spouse. Cause when you're serving, you go to the base and you have like, you know, all these friends because you have your coworkers and you, you know all these people in the military. If you're a spouse, you you don't really have anyone unless you live in base housing. You might be able to find someone, but it's not the same. You know, it seems to me that a lot of issues affecting oh. military families, from food insecurity to employment to child care, all focus on duty station transition uh, and the difficulty in duty station transition for not just the, the individual airman, soldier, Marine, Coast Guardsman or sailor, and what are the Space Force people called? I don't know. We're know. called guardians. Guardians. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would have put that one on hold if I were in charge, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they were pretty quick to come up with that one. Yeah, I was going to say, wow, Guardians of the Galaxy. I, I get it now, right? So what the I when you ask where they're, they're on, they've got to be on moon bases is what I'm figuring. <laughs> You're probably putting up with a lot of this, though, for the Space Force. Um, well, I mean, I feel like it's my job to educate people about what the Space Force does because it's so like shrouded in mystery of like, what do they do? And so, yeah. Hey, I'm on your team. I, I was in the Coast Guard. And so, and Dominic knows this, we do this dinner every year and I'm the only Coast Guard. I'm like the unicorn that shows up. Yeah. And, um, and I know Dom now knows too. So there are apparently two of us. I, I, we have other members here, either Josh or Isabella, if you had a question. Yeah, I had some questions, but you were pretty thorough and took a few of them. Um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Amanda, thank you for your service. Thank you. And I guess you, I mean, you talked a little bit about the, you know, when you got to basic training, the, you know, you, you had the physical part done, but the mental was something that you weren't exactly expecting. Was there... Were there some other chapters, I guess, like for trials and tribulations where maybe you had a little bit of doubt, like whether it was for you or whether, I guess, like maybe a woman did belong in the Air Force and when you, that passed and you knew, okay, I, I got this. Yeah, I think the best example of that, that was a really good question, is when I deployed, before I left, my commander took me aside and like, you know, had a little counseling session before I left and he gave me a journal and it said if you come to a great chasm in life jump it's not that far and that quote was like my lifeline because there were lots of times when I was like I can't do this and the military is not very nice or maybe they are nice because they forced you to do it but every time I would have to do something that I didn't think I could do like you know well I got stuck in rollover training and I didn't like that and I freaked out and the guy in front got me to calm down but like getting in the vehicle I was like if you, you know when you come to a great chasm jump it's not that far and so I would just tell myself over and over like jump jump like the first time I went on a mission off base jump and every time I did that I learned it wasn't that far I made it a lot scarier than it was and I was able to do whatever thing I had to do and so that kind of gave me confidence throughout the deployment and even when I left the military, that's why I started my business was I started a blog because I was like, well, let's just see what happens and we'll just jump. It's not that far. And so that's kind of how it's been like my motto for the rest of my life. That's a great motto. Yeah. It's Joseph Campbell's quote. So someone tried to attribute it to me once when I used it. I was like, no, I didn't. I didn't come up with it. So. The question I had it was just a, a little bit of what was did I hear you are you and your husband were both in the military at the in the Air Force at the same time. Yeah. Were you were were you guys stationed together? Um, like how much how much time did you guys spend at the same base, or how much time did you spend? Was it more together or more apart? Um, 
It was like 50 50 if you add in like trainings and TDYs. And because I initially, well, first I went to Alabama for training and then I went to New Mexico and he was there and we were together for like two and a half years. And then I deployed and I was gone for uh just over a year. But when I came back, he was gone and he had moved to Ohio. And so then it took a few months for me to in process and then out process and then eventually make my way to Ohio. And then, and then when we were in Ohio, we were together because he was going to school most of the time and there wasn't a lot of TDYs because that was sequestration time where they didn't have any money and we didn't really do anything. So, so yeah, that was part of why I got out because we like spent so much time apart. We never actually moved together when we were both in the military. So we got to the same place. It just took a while. All right, Josh, you have anything else? No. Raymond, any save rounds? No, I think that um, I just really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I think what you, the book you put together sounds like it's a, a great service to um, both men and women um, to understand the difference in the roles and the similarities too. Because that was my next question is, What's the biggest thing that we think is different, but it actually is very the same for both men and women? And you covered it really when you said the 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 fear of the unknown. Um, you said when Joss asked you about you know that question, it's one I ask every every veteran. What was it, the third or the fourth day of boot camp that you woke up thinking you'd made the biggest mistake of your life, right? <laughs> and yeah. every veteran goes, yeah, it was the third day or the second day or the fourth day. Um, so we all have that experience, and I think that's very cool. You've expressed that very well. Yeah. Was it your second or third day you woke up thinking you made a big mistake? Oh, I, I feel like it was the first day. <laughs> 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 I was like, what did I get into? Yeah. Exactly. The first day, though, everything's moving so fast. And they're yelling at you. You expected it, but then you wake up the second day, and then and I don't know about you, but I had to pay for that damn haircut. And that really just threw me into a depression. They charged me 75 cents to take all my hair out. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. My flight got, so my flight got delayed and I ended up like landing at like midnight because there was like a missed flight and connection. And so I didn't, I, so I missed the first day. And so I woke up the next morning, like not getting very much sleep, didn't have any of my stuff because it came in in the middle of the night. And like, I was like, what is going on? So, so my first day was really the second day. Now, were you at Fresno State when they demolished the library? Uh, I was there when they were building it or I don't think they had demolished it yet, but I'm like, I was there and they were either working on it or they were planning it. But my parents live like right down the road from Fresno State. So I've been back and I was like, what is this place? It's so different than it was, you know, I guess it's been a few years since I graduated. Yeah, it's been a while because I was there the semester they demolished the library. That's my first day. They demoed the library in the middle of class um, and it exploded and imploded. And there were no air conditioning in those classrooms uh, and the old building. The were... Yeah, it was a terrible place. It was just terrible. But um, yeah. anyway, so I must have been there and I just was like, because I remember they were like building it or they were planning it. So, yeah. I graduated in the spring of 2007, so. And where can people get a copy of your book? Uh, it's on Amazon, or you can go to my website, and you, airmentomom.com, and you can just go and look for, you know, books that I've written, and then you can get there. But it's available on Amazon. That's all I got, Dom. I was saying that's absolutely perfect, then. So then uh, we appreciate you coming out and uh, and speaking with us, uh, giving us a little more insight into things that we didn't know about. And that's, you know, part of what we're doing here is learning constantly more about what we can do to help and unique problems that we didn't even know existed. So uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for everything, you, you know, for being here tonight and doing everything you did. Thank you. Of course. So with that, we will be moving on in our conversation, but you're more than welcome to hang out with us. That's fine. All right. Well, I do not have a uh, itinerary in front of me, but I bet Raymond does. Next up is Action 360, buddy. 
Okay. So we got a couple things going on. Um, first off, Teacher of the Year is next uh, March 9th or May 9th, next Thursday. We, the foundation, Rotary Foundation, bought uh, eight seats at the dinner. Uh, and I am the master of ceremonies. You don't want to miss that. Uh, so if you'd like to be at the dinner, uh, we've already paid for the tickets. Uh, number two is the USMC dinner and uh, committee and food drive is beginning to meet. Um, I will tell you, um, for the feeding military who's food drive in September, I've sent a, a letter to the Los Angeles Police Department. As you know, the Sheriff's Department was our is our partner in March. And so I've challenged the Los Angeles Police Department to be our partner in September. And we'll see if we can get the same kind of thing going. Uh, where they're putting a donation box in every one of their community stations, and then we get all that food delivered down to the Masonic Lodge, and we can transship it to um, uh, to the three bases. Hopefully, we'll be able to expand to uh, Nellis uh, March of next year. Um, other than that, the, the dinner committee, we are going to hold it again this year at the Masonic Lodge for a couple of reasons. One is that the transition in the women's club um, you know, they're going through a, a sometimes success is hard on organizations and they were successful and it was very hard on them. Uh, and so we don't know if they would have the ability to sell enough tickets for us to expand. So I think this year we'll just go forth, Daniel, sell another 120 tickets and have 100 seats and have a good dinner and raise, you know, 20 or $30,000 and think about next year expanding it. So that's where everything is, Dom. Um uh, I don't know. Is there anything else? And of course, Josh is a brand new Rotarian. He's our newest Rotarian. Uh, so oh. everyone say hello to Josh from Waste Management. We sincerely appreciate him being here today. Um, Brandon. you have me. You have me with the uh, Rotary, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So welcome, Josh. Right, I had to have you here today. So uh, next, I add to real quick. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. You were garbled, garbled, Josh. What do you want? Yeah, um, I was gonna say I'll take um, I'm gonna set up some boxes too at our at our truck yard for the food drive. Excellent, Perfect. and we, we uh, excellent, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. We'll have, we'll have the gas company. We'll have waste manager doing that. That'd be excellent. Um, so in waste management was a big help last year or in March. They provide those boxes, which we decorated and were able to put in a variety of businesses and civic locations mm -hmm. throughout the Southland. So we'll look forward to doing that again. Yeah, absolutely. Are you ready for the calendar there, Brother Dominic? Hit it. Okay, so these are what's going on. Um, we just had Amanda. So next meetings, uh, board meetings next week, and then after that, um, we have uh, in the noon club will be how Rotary clubs can save a child from life of poverty and crime. Richard Rosen is the literacy chair of a Rotary district in the Midwest. In the evening, uh, the satellite club will have Jason Wise from Combined Arms, and it is a veteran started nonprofit. And as just as you know, the Combined Arms uh, concept on the battlefield, they're using those that same concept to support veterans. In June, um, it's Alex Tremble Connect to Lead. And then we'll have uh, Robin Bartlett. Now, Robin Bartlett was a first lieutenant in Vietnam. His book is Charlie Alpha, which is um, uh, combat air assaults. And so he'll be talking about being in the 82nd uh, Airborne Division in the Air Mobile. And then coming up onto that, we'll have in July, our, we have Mission 22, another veteran uh, organized uh, support group. And then on the 24th is Colonel Isaac Lee, a Marine Corps combat aviator, a 30 year Marine, uh, sounds like a really interesting guy. And we have Carly Kenworthy from the fund.org and Steve Weintraub. Now, Steve Weintraub is from Vet Ticks, and this is a nonprofit that gets like tickets to NASCAR and gives them out to uh -oh. veterans. So it should be, oh, really, yeah. yeah, really interesting guy. Uh, and then finally, we have um, Endeavor, which is a program that's in September. So we're pretty much Got some great programs in the evening uh, for any of the Rotarians that can make these meetings. And you can see also that we've got great meetings at the noon club. So feel free to come to either of those meetings. That's what we have for the calendar. Fantastic. Yeah, that Vetix was interesting. I signed up for it right when they started. And that was, was going to Mount Sac. So that would have been like right after I got out in 07. So like 07-ish. 
and they've been around this long. I'm like, God, good for you guys. And they've only gotten bigger, and I see stuff from everywhere. So that's exciting. That's a lot of uh, a lot of solid speakers coming out. I'm really happy. Uh, I have now. You know, Mount Sac is a real sore spot with me right now. So that's why I bring it up. <laughs> that's all I got for you, Vomic. All right, all right. Then with that, like I said, I don't, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the itinerary, so I can't see what's going on. That's it. We're closing remarks of the president, and we're done. All right, closing remarks. First and foremost, once again, man, thank you for coming out. We appreciate you. Um, it, like I said, it's good to hear another perspective. Uh, then with everyone else here, I'm going to keep pushing. There's a lot more details that come along with the uh, USMC dinner. I'm sure it'll be a success again. We cannot wait. Um, Let's see if we can fill those eight seats, or I guess now seven seats. Or do you take a seat, Raymond? I don't know how that works. Point is, always that let's try to get the rest of the Rotarians in there. Like Mike Wallace, I'm sure, is going to show up, so on and so forth. Um, but let's try to get out there and have some fun. Um, watch Raymond do a fantastic job up there speaking. And then uh, that's at, where is it? Uh, Pacific, right? Life Pacific University, Life. yeah, 4.30 yeah. to 7 o'clock. Got it. Uh, and then after that, yeah, uh, obviously we'll ramp up. We'll keep doing what we're doing, and then we'll ramp up for our, uh, our September drive. So I look forward to all of that with you guys and working more and more. And as you guys know, I don't like to, you know, waste anyone's time. So I appreciate everyone coming out and thanks for today. See everybody next uh, week. See you. Uh, see you. Yeah. See you a little soon. Bye.